Hello, everyone. Uh, glad to be here. I'm going to talk to you about some Mojalicious gardening. So the meta slide I always talk about uh, at the beginning of any talk, because people may come and watch this talk later, so they want to know about it. I'm first giving this talk very, right here, and if I ever give it again, they will know that. Uh, the talk itself is hosted at jburger.github.io slash gardening. There's a fair amount of code in it, and I've tried to make it as readable as possible, but if you're worried you won't be able to see it, you're welcome to follow along in the talk. Um, the source of the talk is also available, and uh, all of the code samples that you'll see here are complete and run as shown and are available inside of the repository. I also like to quick TLDR. Don't fear the, the full app. Light is just a, a thin wrapper for a full app, and as such, it really isn't that scary to move between the two of them. But I know a lot of people still have huge light apps that they've been afraid to port to full apps, and I hope to fix that. And I'll give you some tools and strategies for that porting. So, and if you need a little bit of help, um, there's the growing guide, of course. And uh, I made an advent post last year for the advent calendar. You can look at the uh, inflate command. Or, of course, you can come talk to us on HashMojo on Perl IRC. While I'm thinking of the advent calendar, a little, little uh, aside, uh, I would love to do the advent calendar again, but I can't possibly do as many articles as I did last year. Now, that was my fault, because I decided to do it way too late. But if people would like to have an advent calendar this year, I need to have at least um, probably half of the articles um, promised to me by other people. So if you have some ideas, and I'll send this out to the mailing list too, but if you have some ideas, please let me know, and I will um, schedule those up. And if we can get enough people, then we'll have an advent calendar. All right, so you made a proof of concept with Mojalicious Light. Good for you. It works, and people like it. Its functionality is good, but the container kind of matters too. So now you need to make it structured and maintainable and understandable and extensible. People have to be able to keep working on it even after you leave. You have to be able to give it off to a big group to develop. You need to grow your light app to a full app. And that's where we get to get some gardening. So let's get started. We're going to look at some components uh, first. The, uh, the different things we're going to have to migrate are the application itself, which starts out as a script and becomes the application module, uh, controller modules, and maybe even some models, hopefully. You have some application keywords, app, helper, hook, and plugin. You have some routing keywords, any, get, post, put, all these ones that you know. And then worse, you have the nested routing keywords, and this is where some of the confusion comes in. You also have your supporting files, like templates and static files. And hopefully you have some tests. Now, unlike most of my talks, I'm not actually going to talk about testing very much in this talk, but you should have some tests. And the only thing that really changes in the testing between the light apps and the full apps is how you load them into the test. And that's well covered in the growing guide, so I'm not going to cover it. For now, we need a little bit of motivation for the talk. Uh, this guy has found his motivation but we're going to look at a live demo. And we're going to see if I can pull up this live demo. So if you go to demo.jburger.pl, uh, you should have, oh, that doesn't open the window. But here you see, we see a map of Oslo. And I'm going to zoom way out, because this is a conference attendance pushpin site, and I am from Chicago. So I'm going to say, I am from here. Uh, that's close enough. <laughs> and if people go on and add their own, eventually, when I would reload it, maybe there would be another person from Chicago. Uh, so pre-action lives about there. Uh, and if anyone wants to, it will show us these people. And while we wait for that, you can imagine that somebody one of these jerks that lives up on the north side is going to write some bad words. Now, this app, oh, see, now we've got someone from Norway. Um, so uh, this app is open to the, to the public, and 
uh, I didn't really want it to be secured by um, any kind of forms and things, because it just was supposed to be a little fun thing. But eventually, you're going to need an admin page. And so I do basic auth. And I'm not going to show you what the password is yet. Hmm. This is why you love live demos. Why you know work. Well, okay. Because I want to go quick, what the live demo should have done, and uh, it just renders a little um, table of the um, Sorry, this is flustered me just a little bit. That's okay. I'll make it through. Uh, it'll render a little page, a uh, simple table of all the different pins that have been added. And uh, this thing just hates me. And lets you have a little button that it's going to remove them. It does it with a basic um, form. It's no problem. Okay. So people can have fun with that for a little while. And we have to get this one back to the talk. OK. So we're going to port this little app. It's, uh, it starts out as a light app. We're going to port it through four more states, uh, a light hybrid, a full hybrid, a full app, and then we're even going to add some models to it. So quickly, this is the application. Uh, I'm not going to show all of it, but just so you can see, it isn't so long. We've got some routes and some helpers, and then some JavaScript, and then some templates. I think it's about, uh, and migrations, I think it's about maybe 170 something lines. So it's a good little proof of concept. Highlight a few parts of it. We have some configuration. I was using a capital B. That was what the problem was. Too late now. Um, this is mostly to show you how configuration is going to move around a little bit through the app. Uh, we're going to use Mojo SQLite, which uh, Sebastian in his talk told us about Mojo PG. There's also Mojo SQLite, which was based off of the Mojo PG model. So um, that works very similarly. We pull the migrations from the data file, uh, the data section, as we saw before. Quickly, the, the uh, schema is very simple. Uh, primary key and Latin long and um, some text. We have some helpers, as many apps have. You start out with a database connection. This just gives you the database uh, handle quickly. Uh, we have a helper method that gives you all of the pins as hashes. And we have some basic auth. Now, this is because uh, we're going to use this basic auth to both log you in and log you out. Because here's a fun thing about basic auth. Do you know if you use basic auth for a website uh, login, your browser, even once you log them out from the session cookie, the browser likes to keep your credentials in the background. So the only way you can reliably log out of a basic auth site is to return a 401 again when you log them out. So this is you know, a demo app, but it was just to show you some interesting things. I wanted to make an app that was very different from the growing guide. Of course, you need some routes. So we've got sort of an API uh, side of the client, which is giving you all of the pins as JSON. Uh, when you do git, that's what the map does the git in the background to show all the different pins. And when you um, post one, you create a new pin by sending the new pin in as JSON as well. Here's where we get to some of the fun bits, the admin page, which I wish I showed you, but I, you know, typos. Um, under the admin route, um, first thing it does is it checks if you have the session already. If not, it checks to see if you've got uh, basic auth in the headers, and if so, and if the password is correct, then it logs you in. And otherwise, it gives you that basic auth failure from the helper that I set up before. But you'll notice this is all inside of this group block. And that group block is meant to protect the git and delete routes, but not any future routes. Those future routes include a logout route, and then the route that renders the map with a you know, catch-all route. So it doesn't matter if you memorize all of that, of course. This is just this demo we're going to look at. We also have some data files that I showed you, pushpin.js, two templates, a layout, and a migrations. 
So now it's time to start moving towards moving. Let's look at a light hybrid form. The purpose of this is to move away from the light DSL, the domain-specific language, the keywords, because you can't use those keywords in a full app. But you can actually use the non-keyword forms in a light app. So this will help you move it and prepare for moving to the full. So the easiest thing to do is, first of all, add a couple little variables at the top of your app. You have my dollar app equals app, so we're going to put the application in a variable. And we're also going to pull out the router. We call it dollar $R with, uh, by convention in the documentation, so I'm going to do that here too. The helper keywords are easy because the helper uh, keyword is just actually a method on the application. So these same helpers we had before are created by the helper method. It's exactly the same code, just called as a method on the application. And all four of those top-level routes are basically just created by methods on the router. Very simple translation. You just wrap the code. Now we get to the hardest part of the whole process, I think, the nested routing. So we have to explain nested routing a little bit. In Mojalicious, routes are a tree. And the routing keywords, with the exception of under and group, uh, add routes to the current router. And the current router is almost always the top level router, the slash route. And all of those are then leaf nodes. They're all endpoints that you can hit. For nested routing, you use the under keyword. Um, which can do several different things. It can share code between the routes, conditionally stop the router, like if you're doing a login, um, replace the current router, that's the interesting one, and that lets you build this sort of root tree, but you don't really see what you're doing, it just says, while I am under this, do these other routes. This creates an inner node in a graph sense, and while this is all confusing, maybe it is a little better to see it as a graph. So here we've created git slash foo, post slash bar, and under slash admin. And this route will handle if it gets a git request or a post request to these. This one doesn't sort of handle it. It just creates this inner node. So if I get slash admin slash safe, it can route down this way and route down this way. And of course, there could be conditions here that could say, oh, you're not permitted to come this way. But, um, that's how this works. So how in this application, after we use the under keyword, would we ever add another route that attaches back to the slash? Well, directly you couldn't do that. But that's where this group keyword comes in. And the group keyword localizes the effect of the under and restores the previous router when you exit it. From the graph perspective, it basically takes it up and puts it on its own little island over here and allows you to continue adding routes. However, once you get to thinking about using group, I already recommend maybe you start doing an object tree instead. So what is an object tree? The object tree is what we're going to start moving our light app to. We build routes off of other routes. All of the router methods uh, with children become inner, inner nodes as before. Any can do that from any git post patch, and that just creates those inner nodes. And as such, in a full app, you really only need it under when you have to share code between the routes or conditionally stop the router. And this looks more like this graph. Here we have $r git foo, $r post foo. It's exactly the same as before. But here we have $r under admin, and it returns a new route. In fact, these returned new routes too, but we didn't use them. And here we can put git safe, git lock under that. And you see that it's just no different to build this next route because you build it off of the original router. In this way, our grouped light app can easily become a proper object tree. The under just returns an admin route. And then we build two more routes off of it. So that our final light hybrid app 
looks very similar to the original one, but has basically no keywords used anymore. The last one I left alone was the app start, because that's just going to go away, as you'll see. So now it's time to, and this one's one of my favorites, because this is an actual sign you can buy, <laughs> made out of metal, and put it in your, I kind of want one. Uh, so now we're going to move to the next stage, the full hybrid app. And this is much easier, because in the previous stage, we got rid of most of the problems of moving to the full app because now it's just mostly moving stuff. The full, app, the full hybrid app is easy, as I said, because we already did that. We're going to split out the supporting files, and we're going to slightly split up the script into an application module and a dummy script. We're still going to use the hybrid routes. So the supporting files, we can use the inflate command, which is built in in Mojalicious or we can move them manually uh, just to see how this works. And so in our examples, by the way, each example in the repository is done four times in a directory named for each of these things, So, you sh uh, five times. So you should be able to just look if ever they're interesting to you. Um, so we move those files that were in the data section to now public uh, pushpin.js, uh, and the other three go into the templates folder. The application class, you do several things. You move it to pushpin.pm. You uh, it, make it a package that inherits from Mojalicious. Uh, you replace the app start with a one, and you wrap it all in a sub. It so happens that the migrations can stay in data if you want, because um, Mojo PG and Mojo SQLite can actually just read from class data. So that was a little confusing. Easier just to look and see that we've made it a module. It inherits from Modelicious. We have basically all the same logic, but it comes inside of a startup method. And the rest of it's basically the same until we get to the bottom, and we now only have the one migrations file. So that was the module. Now we need an application script. This goes in a script directory, and it's just a dummy script intended to load the class. We take uh, the one, I always just take the one from the end of the growing guide, and I change the class name. So it looks exactly like this, and the only thing you have to change from the example in the growing guide is be sure to load the application that you're interested in. No problem. So that was sort of the light uh, style for the full app, the hybrid, light hybrid. To move even further, we can go to the full app. Uh, in this way, we want to have controller classes and routes that point to the controllers. We want to have uh, application attributes instead of closing over like configuration variables and things. And we can make some of the helpers be controller methods instead. And the templates belong to the controllers. So we have the router which previously didn't fit onto one slide, and now it does. Because, as you can see, we have uh, the pins routes go to a pins controller to all create. And especially, let me point out, that even though these two are protected by the admin under, the controller logic can all live inside of the pins controller, because there was really nothing in that logic that depended on being logged in. It just was saying, we don't want an unlogged in user to be able to do it. So we are actually able to put these uh, in a much more sensible location than being close to the admin code. And of course, the other ones as before. Before we had the SQLite um, instance just in initiated inside of the startup method. But now, in a proper full app, you probably want that to be in an attribute. So we take the code that we had before, and we move it to has SQLite, and so this will get initiated on demand. And the only difference from what we had before is we now have to ask the application for its configuration. It will behave exactly as it did before, but uh, we're not going to close over $conf as we did before. We're going to pull it from there. 
And now the full application has gotten even smaller. You see we have our uh, attribute here. We still load a configuration, but we no longer have to put it into a $conf variable. We've got our helpers and our routes and our migrations. So where did all that other code go? Well, it went into controller classes. Here we have a check route, which basically was that admin under. And once again, the only thing that had to change in this was we had to pull the configuration, this time the controller to the app to the configuration. Uh, and you'll notice that also what used to be a helper on the application, uh, I've moved the basic auth into being a method on the controller, because no other controller is going to care about that, that helper, so we don't need to share it with all the controllers. We can keep it just localized inside of this controller. And then it gets used in both places, just as before. Name it with an underscore, by the way, so that you can't possibly route to it as, a, as an endpoint. We also have a pins controller, and this is very much what you would have expected from before. It still uses the DB helper that was provided by the application. And finally, if you're doing the automatic rendering, uh, as I would do in this application, you now want to make the uh, templates live in folders that are related to the controllers itself. So we've moved the two map and table um, templates from just being in the templates folder to pins folder inside the template. So technically, we're done. We've moved to a full app. But if you thought I was going to stop there, you came to the wrong garden. Because really, you don't want to stop there. You want your controllers to just point your um, application to some model logic that you can test outside of your um, application or maybe reuse in other ways. So let's build a basic model class. We have um, the SQLite as a required attribute. So I've just done it as a very simple die if the user hasn't given us SQLite. And I'm going to keep around this little shortcut to pull out a database, if only just to make the, the uh, width of the methods wide enough for the screen. And of course, we have the remaining three methods that we had before, basically. But now we don't need the original model helpers. We need a different model helper. We need a model helper that connects us, that gives us a new instance of the model and gives it the SQLite um, connection from the application. So far, so good. But there's a problem that you probably don't see because I kind of hid from you that in one of the templates, we were using the pins helper. Now, I didn't show you that. That was kind of evil of me. But if we no longer have the pins helper, how are we going to get the pins into the template? Well, it's very simple, because we can stash them. And now it's just dollar pins. But where did they come from? Well, now in the controller class, we stash the pins before we render. And that just comes from the model class as before. If you wanted to be evil, technically you could still call the model method inside of the template. But we're trying to make things better. And uh, that's kind of uh, 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 a bit dirty for your, for your well-structured application. So the controller class now looks like this. It was basically these methods before. But this one used to be empty. And now it actually stashes something. Well, I've gone fast too, haven't I? So that was a lot, yeah. But uh, you have this talk to come back to. You have the growing guide to come back to. And the overview really was just, we started with our prototype. We removed the DSL. We split the application up. We extracted the controllers. And then we extracted the model. The nice thing about this me mechanism, the application was basically always in a runnable state. The tests, if you had tests, would basically always work. And you don't need to sort of scare yourself with what feels like a major rewrite if you go in these small discrete stages. 
and this is gardening. So that's the end of this bit. Uh, do you have any questions for me about this portion? No? Maybe everyone understands growing. Maybe this was... <laughs> if that's true, that would be great. And then, of course, I'm just speaking to you, the audience at home. So this application that I showed you before, I had a lot of fun writing it because uh, I've never really done a sort of mapping application, and I really wanted it to be somewhat different from the uh, application that was in the growing guide. And in doing so, uh, I was starting to write a lot of JavaScript. And we have a new front-end developer in my uh, company. And I was showing him how proud I was of using promises in JavaScript. He said, promises? Oh, you're, you're, you're so two years ago. So here we've got the joys of modern JavaScript. And I had a lot of fun learning this. And I thought I would pass some of these things on to you. First of all is the modules. So all of this works in modern browsers. Uh, if you do um, some JavaScript and you want to load something, you've probably done script source equals whatever. You don't need to do that anymore. You can do script type equals module, and you can import symbols from uh, external files, external URLs, however you want to do it. So in this application, what I've done is uh, I have a function that I've, is provided by my JavaScript, and I just run that function to initialize the map. Inside of that, I import more symbols. You'll notice I didn't load the, uh, this is leaflet.js, which was the mapping uh, thing that I used. I didn't have to load that into my main HTML page. I can pull that in from the dependent JavaScript file. So I don't have to sort of keep track of which dependencies do I need to be sure are loaded in which templates. The JavaScript can, can just provide them. And as soon as you're doing a module, you're in JavaScript strict mode already. And so I can use the let keyword. So I've said let pins equals an empty array and let map exist. So those are let in JavaScript is like my in Perl. And so you're going you're gonna to like using let. Forget all the var crap. That's no good. The first method that I'm going to show you here is export function remove pins. So export just says this is a symbol that we might want to import someplace else. This feels very familiar to Perl programmers, where we would add functions to the export or export OK uh, arrays. In JavaScript, you just do it right as you declare the function. You can actually declare them later, too, but this is so easy. I'd like it this way. We also have nice array iterators. Finally, you don't have to use jQuery or something to give you this. So I can do pins.foreach. And then I do this other funny thing. I've got this little arrow here. And this, looks, this, this may be harder for Perlers, because to us, this looks like a pair. But this isn't a pair, in fact. This is a function call. And the argument to the function is pin. So for each pin, do pin.remove. And if you didn't just have one statement, you could put it in curly braces. Um, around, say, pin.remove and do other things there. Very handy. I have another function, export async function get pins. So obviously, this is exported as well. So you could import it later if you wanted. Uh, the first thing I do is call remove pins because I don't want to have duplicate pins show up all over the place. But now I do a few interesting things. Let the result equal await fetch pins. So by calling async at first, at the top, we now can use the await keyword. And this is where my, my JavaScript developer was teaching me things. I just learned this you know, a week ago. Uh, the fetch command makes a request. Fetch is native in the browser. You're not using jQuery again, but you're doing sort of Ajaxy things. You can fetch the pins route of the application, and it will return a promise. And until the promise resolves, nothing else is going to happen in this, but other things can be happening in the browser. It's non-blocking. And again, you can await the JavaScript parsing, which actually I think is kind of funny that the browser does that asynchronously, but OK, whatever it wants to do. Uh, I've got some more points. And I uh, iterate over the returned data 
set up the different points from um, Leaflet and push them in and set the bounds and all those things. You don't need to care about that. That's kind of fun too. Uh, I also want to set up the double click method um, event to uh, handle when you click on the, the map and you want to add a pin. And this one I just used window.prompt because I was trying to make this very quick. But um, the, we now can also do await the fetch uh, of the pins where we post to it. This is creating the pin. We set up some headers. Uh, the JavaScript fetch is pretty basic, so it doesn't set uh, any content type headers or, or anything. Um, but then you can set the body to stringify some things. I also do this one little clever thing here. So here I do lat goes to um, some you know, lat long from the uh, click event. But here I just do text. And this is a handy shortcut that um, JavaScript gives you, which is if you have a text variable and you want it to be in the um, object as named text, you can just write it once. And it will say, ah, you want the text variable named text. OK, great. And there's a lot of new shortcuts for those things in JavaScript. And now I'm actually done. So. And please go ahead and look at any of those things in the uh, repository, ask me questions, play around with the app. I'll leave it up for a little while. Um, log in as Bender, use the lowercase b, <laughs> delete some pins, have fun with it. Well, uh, uh, should be ready about downstairs? Uh, not yet. Any moment. I finished a little early. Yeah. So if any last chance for any questions. Yep, please. Any other questions? Concerns? Scathing rebuttal? Uh, so the JavaScript I showed you works in um, modern browsers without any sort of preparation for it. Um, you can make it work back to older browsers by using all kinds of Babel and tool chains for this stuff. And, I've sort of been the old staunch, oh, I don't want to do any of that stuff, and I still kind of am. But now I can kind of just start doing it in the browser. And if the browser just does it, I'm happy to use it. So depends on how old you have to support. But if you want to do it just supporting newer browsers, um, as I do, because in my company, I can just tell everyone to upgrade their browsers because it's an internal app, so screw you guys. Um, it's great. And it what makes it. Repeat the question. The question was, what do you call an older browser? I'm assuming you mean not like, you know, make fun of it with names, but like. <laughs> uh, it's pretty recent. It's, I, you know, within the last maybe even six months of Chrome and Firefox. Maybe Chrome. Some of these, fe I mean, these features have been added slowly. So I, it would depend on which feature. The, the biggest one that I wanted was JavaScript modules. The, the import, uh, export, um, type equals module. And those are pretty recent to be actual browser support uh, within a few months, honestly. Not IE. Uh, I mean, Edge probably has it. Um, you want to, we, we can. Um, uh, so can I use? Module. So Edge, Edge 17 supports it. Uh, Chrome has supported it since, uh, since 63, I think it's saying here. And of course, Opera like, is always the thing that doesn't help anything. And, and IE, pff, IE is just, no one uses that anymore, right? No one? No one in the world? Please say that. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you, and uh, have, enjoy your lunch. Yes, sir.